So one thing he left out was that I am first and foremost an artist, a poet, uh, and uh, I, I used to call myself a multi-artist because I like to mix stuff together and uh, do like our first speaker talked about, uh, to, to try to see things from a new angle. And when I sort of accidentally stumbled into parliament, it was never my dream. Uh, actually, when my class went to visit businesses in parliament when I was 14, I sort of decided not to go to the parliament, went to the bus and wrote my first poem with an eyeliner uh, on a paper bag about the aftermath of a nuclear holocaust. Uh, and so I was given the privilege of being right smack in the middle of the belly of the beast without ever becoming it. And the reason why that is important is that I, first of all, I have zero respect for authority, and after being in parliament, I have even less respect for laws. Uh, and so we are governed, all our lives are totally governed by this invisible hand of laws. Think about it. Everything you do is governed by these laws that most people do not understand. So this is the power of the word of the law. And even if the laws are really badly made, and that's why I don't respect them, I've seen how they're made, and it's just so bad. If I would write poetry in that way, I could never get it published or speak it because it's so poorly done. And what, you know, I used to, when I was a teenager, my mom forced me to work in a fishing factory. And uh, the task I had, and of course I rebelled against that method, uh, was to very quickly get all this fish, and you had to very quickly get all the worms out and the bones and stuff. And of course there will always be some worms left that, you know, general public would end up eating and maybe get sick from. Uh, so laws, the process of laws in Parliament is exactly the same. So the laws, nobody really knows who writes them. And it's like the parliaments are completely powerless. They don't have any power. Think about it. How many laws do the parliamentarians write that have like a genuine impact on our day-to-day -day lives? How many cross-party bills and visions are being made? Think about it. Not much. So these laws that are very complicated and getting more and more complex are written by some invisible people. And so, since we are on the continent of Great Britain, uh, many of you might have seen Yes Minister. I used to think it was funny, but now when I look at it, it's more like a documentary and I get relatively depressed <laughs> uh, because it's so spot on. And the reason why I'm telling you this is that we think we live in democracy and we think the sole duty as citizens in this state is to go and vote, like increasingly often, because there is political crisis not only here, but everywhere. And since be people become so sick of it, they just vote for the white knight uh, that's gonna come and rescue them from the mysteries, and they know it. that person is actually a lie. It's like, um, I don't know if you've seen The Wizard of Oz, it's sort of like that, that guy that's sort of hiding in that cubicle, uh, and everybody thinks he's a great wizard, but it's just a frail person that's created this big, majestic reality of uh, fear, really. And so I want to... Um, tell you a little story about what I discovered. So basically, since I didn't know anything about procedure, nothing, and you know, I do, did not only create these parties, my second party, the Pirate Party, became the biggest polling party in Iceland for a year. And it was so funny to watch the other politicians, like the conservatives had ne never been polling below anyone, let alone some like, three parliamentarians from a pirate party. It would just upset them so much. <laughs> and uh, since my parliamentary experience was sort of an art installation that nobody really knew that they were part of, I had the privilege of pretending that I didn't know anything, so I could do things differently. 
And I achieved a lot of stuff because I pretended I didn't know all these ways of being inside that establishment. And I'm not saying people shouldn't go inside and be the annoying fly in the tent, but that's really the extent of your influence if you are just a common parliamentarian, to be honest. Uh, you do not have the power that a lot of people think you have. And in particularly if you're a minority, you're just there to look for worms, in honest, honestly. So I'm more excited about stuff like assemblyism. I'm more excited about stuff that includes the general public being able to have a discussion about their values in a collective space with people that have very many different opinions. Uh, and to um, add on that knowledge that we need to have about all these different complex issues. And in reality, the solutions to these different complex issues are often quite simple they are not as complicated as they make us believe. Um, an example, uh, when I was in Parliament first, we just had this massive crisis, and there was this energy in the air that we were going to get a new constitution. Current constitution is a recycled, horrible constitution given us as a gift from the Danish king when we got our independence, and it doesn't fit us. Uh, and so, in the crisis, everything slowed down, people were meeting face to face, we had all these amazing civic meetings and protests, and uh, the government was elected in on, and, and also my party, or movement was elected in on, that we would help facilitate a constitution written by and for the people of Iceland. And we had assemblies that people were randomly selected to. We had constitutional parliament elected. Anyone could run. And they had open meetings. And it was just beautiful. And the product of this new social agreement was simple. It was in such a language that every one of us could understand these rights. And do never forget what a constitution is. It is not an abstract. Absolutely not. It is your way to keeping those uh, that you trust to look after the interest of the whole, to keep them accountable and on their toes. So they can't say, oh, you're unhappy with us. No, you just show it in the next elections. Uh, absolutely pathetic and, and a mockery of democracy when they do that. We have to be able to hold these people to an account. And we have to reinvent the way we do democracy. Because even if these institutions we hold dear, and I hold the, the parliaments and everything quite dear, it is the only tool we have now. But why not completely transform it so it is more uh, as an institution that facilitates in an easy way um, the general consensus, and we have to make consensus. It's not enough just to do simple polling. We have to create the spaces, like we have created, or, or this institute here has created a space for us to come together and share ideas and open our minds about different ways of doing things. And I am actually, like I have to say, of all the different countries I've been to, currently I think Scotland has that additive energy of possibility of change. And you are, in my opinion, the new hope right now because of many different ideas that are not only being discussed but being let into reality. And I encourage you, if you think about like going to assemblies, how extraordinary it is to be able to talk about like the future. Like, talk about how the future is that you want to live in. And for the old and the young, for the rich and the poor, to have that discussion. Uh, for people from different uh, uh, status and education. I mean, never think that uneducated people are uneducated. Some of the most intellectual, amazing people I've met have not a, a sort of a degree from a university. Education is not about degrees, it's about how you perceive and how you process uh, the knowledge that you have access to. And so, um, 
media, politicians, the unseen bureaucrats that actually are the ones that control us, these are such influencers on us today. And so it is important to just step back and learn to listen. Learn to listen like Momo and the, in the, the Momo and the Time Thieves, where you really listen and you not only like uh, uh, Asa, uh, Asa said, and I thought that blew my mind totally when she talked about that the tree is still the same. It's, it's an incredible. And so it's like, um, I live in a tiny community and I have to leave very often because like Iceland has 335,000, I think, or 40,000 today, I don't know. Uh, and so that means that you are stuck in the perception of what people think about you. And so I encourage people to create a space in their lives where they can go out of these per perceptions of others and, uh, and to understand that you are so powerful. You have so much power. And that power, just like when you sing, when you sing solo, it's interesting, then when you sing in a choir, it is incredible. Uh, and so, you know, the most important thing I see today is to figure out what do we have in common? What do we agree on instead of spending all this time and effort into discussing what divides us? Because that is really what's happening right now. We are living in a time where everything is fragmented uh, and there is no virtue in mending something that is so fractured that, you know, it's never going to be whole again. And so I challenge you, I challenge you to spend time alone with others in big groups to talk about how is the next five years going to be? How are we going to be in the next 50 years? And how are we going to be in a week? because more and more we're having difficulties in understanding the power of the imagination and the power of creating blueprints. I mean, there was this dude, like John Lennon, he made this like really neat little blueprint called Imagine. And, you know, if you look at it, it's sort of like a lot of us, you know, or a lot of people that I've talked to sort of dream of this vision. It, so how about just trying to figure out how do we achieve one bit of it, you know? Uh, what bit is the most important of that vision? Uh, or create an entirely new vision of the future, the ideal world. I mean, we're always going to be human. We're going to be really shitty and selfish. And, you know, there are lots of people that will always try to climb on others. But how do we keep them at bay, you know? And how do we keep ourselves honest, you know? And how do we stay in and believe in the God at the same time we apply rational thought to it. I mean, it's like simple stuff. And in the end, at these very, very, very critical times we're living at, it's pretty scary. And I want you to panic. I really want you to panic. <laughs> but at the same time, get grounded in that uncertainty and do your due diligence as a citizen, as the demo in democracy, and get us out of this crazy in the democracy. So here to the demo, you are the demo, and maybe you can do more demo in the democracy, you know, demand your rights, but at the same time be willing to invest time and energy in Achieving that, democracy is your garden. If you don't tend to it, it's going to get, you know, full of weeds or you're not going to get any potatoes if you don't put them down. <laughs> so, uh, tend to your democracy garden. And today we are going to be inspired by lots of, lots of things. I'm already super inspired. So thank you very much for having me. Uh, and um, I, I was like, how much time do I have left? Oh, all right. Uh, I don't have any sense of time, so I'm not going to finish right yet. Okay, so <laughs> uh, I'm going to tell you another story. Okay, all right. So I'm going to tell you another story 
which is um, about power, because for me, power is one of the most dangerous drugs in the world. And uh, for somebody like me, who was, oh, I've always been like an activist. I like woke up when I was born and I was just like a born activist. In a sense that if I see injustice, I can't just sit and do nothing. If I see somebody suffering, I cannot just ignore it. If I see, uh, you know, like for example, and I, I wish more people was, were like this. For example, if I see injustice and it's reflecting on my life and somebody says, well, why don't you just leave it? And then I always think, well, what about the others that are gonna suffer? Uh, and so, I, you know, I'm, this is very tiring but, uh, to be like this, but it, it's very important that more people devo develop this skill of wanting to butt in, you know, uh, because that's part of being in a community and society. Uh, and so, uh, when I w sort of, and seriously, I just woke up in Parliament one morning. It was like totally unexpected. Uh, didn't think that my movement would get in. We were sort of a hit and run movement that uh, we had to dissolve after a term. And our main goal was to get the constitution done and to make sure that we would not like uh, socialize private debt and stuff like that. Um, but so, like, when I was in there in the parliament, um, um, and in particularly, like, after I, like, my party, the pirate party started to poll so high, um, everything changed. And I, I thought it was the greatest curse of this movement that I helped facilitate. You know, our role was to have, like, liquid democracy and easy access for not only our members, but everyone in Iceland to be able to participate in our digital platform, and then we would take it into the parliament. But none of that happened because everyone got so preoccupied with the polling. You know, everyone was so afraid to alienate those that said they liked us. And, and so um, what happened was that a lot of people started to self-censor, and they started to want to censor me. Like, I am not the type of person that... Uh, thinks everything through, I, I'm very much in the space that I'm in and I, I'm very good at listening to what's happening and usually I'm right, very often I'm wrong too, but you know. And, and so, but the, the scariest part was that, you know, I managed to achieve to get like the mandate to form a government so I could possibly be the next prime minister. And uh, I didn't want to be that. I actually had like a nightmare about it years ago, like how it is to be a prime minister. It's like, uh, must be a terrible job. Um, and, but the, the, the way people were projecting power onto me, power that I never asked for, and they were projecting it such a way, like they gave me, when I had this mandate, I got like, you know, I went to the president and he gave it to me and I, I suggested that I would make him an object so he could give it to people because he didn't have it and it was symbolic. The prime minister the, is the most powerful person in Iceland, not the president. It's sort of like a cookie decoration thing instead of a king. And, um, but the thing is that everything changed. The moment he gave me this imaginary mandate Everything changed as well. People were like, all of a sudden had access to all the stuff in the ministries and we had access to all the budgets and the, the invisible guy that makes the Excel document about the budget and, and, and that kind of stuff. But the scariest thing was that, and I created my movements with horizontalism. So I wasn't the leader, but everyone was projecting the leadership on me. Like, and it's like, and I even made like a massive mockery of the entire media and the parliament and everyone else, even in my own political movement, by when they asked me, well, how should we title you? And I said, just call me captain. And then like the state broadcaster would say, yes, and uh, Birgitta Jonsdottir, the captain of the pirate party. And, uh, and I was like always dying from laughter inside because it was, it was a mockery of this title of the leader kind of thing. But they projected this thing onto me and the international media did as well, like we were the story for the elections in 2016, so all the mainstream media came to Iceland. I told them, look, we're not gonna get 50% or 40% or anything like that. They, didn't, they just got a free ticket to Iceland. I mean, it's like, 
I knew that, that was why they didn't want to hear me. And then they kept titling me as the, the chairman or the captain or whatnot. And, uh, but the people in my movement, they started to see me as this and they started to, whenever I was talking to, start talking to my friends and kids or cat, uh, they gave authority to these rants I had or brainstorms. So all of a sudden people were going to the media saying, uh, you know, Birgitta demanded this. And I was like, what? No. <laughs> and, and it was so scary. And this is one of the main reasons I left, because it's easy to get high on this. It's easy to just take this and like think, yeah, I say stuff and people do stuff. <laughs> and it's not good. And so if people have any illusions about going to the top in the world, what does it mean? There are lots of people below you. And that's not the reality I want to live in. I want to live in the circle of power where people do stuff they're good at in different bits of the circle, but we're all in the circle. Not everyone is good at writing. Not everyone is good at speaking. Not everyone is good at reading laws. So if people can stop having this fantasy about the greatness of being in different positions and just feel comfortable in their strength as well, because we all have different strengths, and if there would be nobody willing to read the Excel documents, I mean, it's like I can imagine uh, uh, the MC here being good at like remembering details and stuff, which I'm not. Uh, I'm good at remembering the bigger picture, uh, and I wouldn't even try to pretend that I could do stuff that I can't. And, the, the mastery of any sort of collective is to be able to distribute responsibilities so that we have a nice, smooth project going on. And then finally, um, I want to tell you another thing that I did some experimentation with. So I grew up in this fishing village, right? We had like 800 people in it or something. And even, I don't recommend villages, uh, if you are weird like me. Um, and I was the weird kid in the village. Um, later discovered I have Asperger's or something. And, um, but, so everyone knew sort of their role in the village. So you get into the city and you just get totally lost. I don't know how many old people I met on the bus that are totally lost in the city once they get there. They, they don't have any function. And so I've made an effort wherever I live to get to know my neighbors. So I, I regularly go to this uh, old woman that lives next to me. We don't have much in common, but she's really lonely and I'm sure I can learn stuff from her. And so she knows if she needs help with something, she can come to me. And I know if I need help with something, I can go to her. And I think it is very important to, you know, if you want to build communities, build them first you know, where you live and stop thinking that there are any politicians, I don't care how amazing they are, that are going to fix it because they won't. You are the ones that are going to fix it with their help. Um, and really pressure for, like, I have heard that the Scottish Parliament is thinking of having, instead of Lords, a uh, House of Commoners, like a sortition based. Uh, house, make sure that if they do it, that these people have proper access to knowledge and information about all the silly procedures that are in all parliaments in the world. And again, remember how incredibly powerful you are alone, but in particularly, you are powerful collectively. So thank you very much for listening to me. Bye.